Hello, everybody. Welcome to this webinar. This is Alan Gassman. I'm here with Dr. Luz Randolph, and we're going to talk about private foundations, both passive private foundations and private operating foundations, and ways to help charities and to help people who need and appreciate help. Luz, yeah. welcome to the Gassman Studios on the 32nd floor of the Burbank <laughs> Hotel Building. <laughs> I love it. It's fantastic. I love this is my favorite part of the month. Every session we have, it feels like very nerve wracking at first. But it's always my favorite because you just make it feel so comfortable. Welcome, everyone. <laughs> Thank you very much. So remember, you, you can watch the replays. If you send us an email, we'll tell you how or you'll click. We talked about new charitable contribution laws, March 17th. We did a survey of charitable gifting vehicles on April 21st. Uh, we're going to have on June 16th life insurance planning, both charitable and non-charitable, with Professor Jerry Hesh, who is a nationally known authority in the life insurance area and, of a, and a heck of an interesting guy. And then on Wednesday, July 21st, Manhattan charitable lawyer Michael Lehman is going to join us and talk about charitable planning for the business owner. So we hope that you'll attend these, watch them, listen to them, memorize them, tell your friends about them, fold, spindle, mutilate, whatever you like, just enjoy. Um, we will provide the CPE and CLE information for this course to all attendees, as well as any certifications that you may request. And one hour after we are done, which is usually about 1.5 billable hours if you're a lawyer, we will send you an automatic email, which will include a replay that you can click on, your certification, and any handouts. And if you uh, want to receive some handouts, if you just put send us a question of anything you'd like to receive, we will be glad to put that in the uh, handout. So uh, thanking Jesse, Luz, and Jody for all they do for the St. Pete College development team and all they do for the community to attract good karma and occasionally a little bit of money for yes. St. Petersburg College. Where would we be without them? So Luz, tell me on page six about the Titans Achievement Program. So um, again, thanks, Alan, for being so supportive of St. Petersburg College and our mission in really changing our community and just making sure everyone is as educated as possible and making um, education access and equitable. So. One of the things that we continuously think about is how do we provide uh, better access to education? And over the last year, we've been working really closely with Helios Education Foundation in this first phase of what we wanna call is a strategic planning process to create a Helios Titan Achievement Program. And the name is flexible, but that's what we called it. And essentially is, it's a pathway for us to be able to help Pinellas County African-American high school graduates go into not only a two-year degree, but a four-year degree. So we're creating a pathway program, right? We're creating uh, opportunities to collaborate with institutions, not only across the Bay, such as USF, but others like UCF and FAMU, where we are bringing in high school graduates from Pinellas County, black male high school graduates to be specific, and creating a pathway for them to receive an education here and get a, uh, either a two or four-year degree, whether it's at SBC or, or transfer them over to institutions that do offer their four-year degree. So working with Helios has provided us an opportunity over the last six months to really work collaboratively across partnerships, not only with um, higher education institutions, but Pinellas County Pinellas County Schools, Pinellas Education Foundation, and other primary partners in our community to really work on what a program like this would look like and how we work together to support them. This couldn't have happened, though it could have happened without the support of Helios Education Foundation. Their support was essential because it allowed us to not only bring the people to the table, but hire folks as consultants to really look at all of the structures of all of our institutions that will help us create this pathway, right? These recommendations. So Heal has provided um, the initial funding for this phase of the program. Our goal is to finish the strategy session at the end of this month and hopefully be able to submit to Helios or and receive additional support from other private organizations um, and create a program that would help us ensure that we are providing a, a pathway for 
for these students. So that is what the Helios Titan Achievement Program is right now, and we are really excited about what is to, to come from it. So Helios is providing you with organizational support but also money for scholarships, or how specifically does it work? So specifically right now with this particular initiative, they've provided us um, funding to be able to hire the consultants and hire our coordinators to help create this strategy phase of the, of the program. However, Helios has assisted and will assist um, other organizations, has assisted SPC with scholarship funding as well. So Helios Education Foundation, really um, their purpose is to focus on um, providing support to Florida and Arizona, those are the two main states where black and brown um, access to education is not as equitable. So those are the two states that they focus on. So they do provide scholarship programming funding and they may do other fundings that are in alignment with their mission. Do you have any idea how many students will, at SPC will be impacted by this program? So there can be a lot of students that are impacted for this program because we are concentrating St. Petersburg College, as, um, as we've shared before, is not only a school where people can get two-year degrees, four-year degrees, we also have certifications and professional um, um, programs. This particular initiative, though, is only going to focus on immediate high school graduates. As of now, one of our, our goal would be to ensure that our first program may have up to 50, could have up to 50 students if we get funded. The reason why we're starting at 50 is many more Black African-American males graduate from Pinellas County and come to SPC. Uh, however, we want to ensure that we create a pathway and, and apply the structure and recommendation. So as of the moment, I'm uh, our goal would be 50, um, but it can increase depending on the size of funding we um, get, right? So if we get an endowment that you know generates two hundred or $300,000, we may be able to, we're also gonna provide scholarships to these students. So that may help us increase the number of students. But it's not only increasing the number of students, it's how do we provide the resources, right? Sort of search as a coordinator or advisors to these students, which we do have, but because it's a dedicated program, do we want to be able to ensure that we have a dedicated staff for this particular program? So we have to scale ourselves so that we don't bite more than we can chew. But the hope would be that an initial program could help up to 50 students. Okay, very good. Well, I don't know who the Helios people are, but they certainly what? seem genuine. Should I? You know everyone. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll send you a link. I'll make an introduction. <laughs> All right. And by the way, if anyone on this webinar wants to make a donation, you can make a donation and I'll give you a lifetime free subscription to the Thursday report. At, yes. any book, at any book I've ever written, just send me a receipt and that's what you'll have. So uh, just as a reminder, we have a federal tax law that will subsidize your gifting and your clients gifting. And it's extremely favorable this year and this year only and last year that you could take an unlimited amount of money from your IRA and that will generate adjusted gross income. But then you can donate that money to a public charity or a private operating foundation or a community foundation and get a 100% tax deduction. So those taxpayers who are over 70 and a half that have been annually and generously giving up to 100,000 a year to their IRA, this year, if you're over 59 and a half, you can do that with the same beautiful impact. And if you have appreciated stocks or, depre or depreciated real estate or assets worth more than you paid for them, and you would like to donate them to get a tax deduction equal to their fair market value and avoid paying any capital gains tax, you can do so by making that transfer to a public charity or to a, your own private foundation, or to your own uh, private operating foundation. And that's what we're gonna talk to about today. We're gonna talk about private foundations and private operating foundations. And what I have found and what many tax lawyers have found over the years is that families or many families are more likely to donate more for purposes of public charities 
if they do so through a private foundation. And there's a lot of reasons for that, and there's a lot of technical reasons and a lot of technical rules. But I think that the two things that really attract successful and wealthy people to do this are recognition and control. Because you can be better recognized or more accurately recognized as somebody who is charitable by giving in the name of the John and Mary Smith Foundation than under the name John and Mary Smith. Let's face it, it sounds cooler. It sounds like you're bigger. It sounds like you're better. And maybe you are. The second advantage is control. You get the tax deduction as soon as you put the assets in your own foundation and you get to control that money. So if you have your own foundation, maybe your last name is Helios, and you decide that you want a $2 million tax deduction this year for $2 million worth of stock that only costs you $100,000 and you don't wanna pay that capital gains tax, you're gonna have the liquidity event, you know it's gonna to go to charity eventually, you want the recognition, but you're not sure exactly how to do this or when you're gonna do this. You haven't even really chosen the public charity to support. You go ahead and put this stock in your private operating foundation and you can deduct up to 30% of uh, an amount up to 30% of your adjusted gross income. So if your adjusted gross income is 10 million and you have $3 million worth of this stock, you can deduct the entire donation of the stock when it is made to the private operating foundation. And then the private operating foundation will pay zero tax when it sells the stock, zero tax. So let's say you have $9 million worth of this stock and you sell the stock your capital gains tax on $9 million is a million eight. And then you donate 3 million to the school or to a charity. You're having to pay more tax than if you had first donated one third of your stock to the foundation, because then you're getting a $3 million deduction so the next three million that you sell is tax free and you only pay tax on the last three million. So that the example is if you're going to sell your family business and people on this call are going to sell family businesses and represent people who sell family businesses, think ahead and immediately before you are legally bound to sell it under the sale agreement. In other words, after you've signed the letter of intent, the buyer is still doing due diligence. You have not signed the final sale agreement. You are, not, you are not legally bound to sell it. That's when you transfer part of your stock to your private operating foundation and get a nice tax deduction, get nice recognition, and start looking for the charity that you can actively support. Lose anything to add to that? Did I lose you? No, I'm right here. I'm listening in. I just took myself off mute. No, I think um, over the last year, I've been here for about a year and a half, and um, we worked with several foundations, and we had a family private foundation who just out of the blue uh, wanted to, you know, they had a death in the family. They certainly wanted to honor the individuals, and they utilized their family foundation to make the gift although they themselves could have made a gift, they chose the family foundation. And again, that's that's your choice. It's That's why they're there for. But I use that as an example because there's so many different ways that um, we receive them. And although we are not your advisors, we really want to work closely with the advisors. That's just a great opportunity for you to enhance that gift and to make a, an immediate impact, right? Because sometimes individuals can create themselves, whether it's an endowment or provide a multi-year gift that's millions of dollars, 
but sometimes some of the things that they want to see cannot be realized right away, right? Because there's still gotta be some component that needs to happen before we were able to, to make those dreams for, for the philanthropist or the family be realized. So I, I, I love that you share that because it's so true. We get that quite often and we wanna get it more, more. Because I think if, if there are people out there who have the opportunity to do that, we're certainly an avenue to get it done. Yeah, I'll tell one story. Uh, uh, one of our favorite clients, you know, pretty much decided that leaving a child who's grown up and responsible more than a few million dollars and leaving nothing to charity was not as good for the child. Mm -hmm. So this, this client said, you know, I'll leave each of my children seven million. And I think that's a lot of money. And uh, my children don't think it's a lot of money because it's a lot less than what I'm worth, but I think it's a lot of money. And then I'm going to leave each child a foundation. Mm. So if I have 15 million per child, each of my children's going to get seven. Good luck. Don't blow it. And then they're going to get another eight. And the eight, they have to hold in a private operating foundation and they have to be active. And then they can get a paycheck for reasonable work that they do for the private operating foundation. And they have to spend at least 100 hours every calendar quarter doing something charitable. Mm. It's explained in this client's trust that the meaning of life is not luxury and retirement. The meaning of life is, is helping others. So I I agree. And if they want to pay off student loans, let them know that all I need is less than 200,000. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. That's a, that's perfect. That's, that's a great thing to have. All right, so a little <laughs> bit, a little bit of alphabet soup here. Awesome. Uh, we have a chart. I know everybody's been dying to get this chart. The summary of restrictions applicable to different types of entities. Because a lot of people say, I don't want to do a private foundation. There's too many restrictions that apply. So I've got here a public charity, such as St. Petersburg College, a community foundation, a donor advised fund, a private operating foundation, and a private foundation. So with a public charity, by definition, it is either a school, a hospital, a medical research organization, or a charity that receives most of its donations from public donors, the general public, not one particular family in particular, or from the general public by buying admissions and paying for charitable related services. The cost of establishing a public charity is not of concern to the donor because it's already been established. The tax deductions are as good as they get. And the charity cannot benefit private individuals other than to pay them reasonable amounts for the services that they render. And uh, they are not prohibited, a public charity is not prohibited from entering into transactions with its donors. And that can be important because sometimes donors want to sell assets to foundations or be owners with foundations. And public charities can own company stock, voting or non-voting. Public charities will be subject to income tax when they receive income from non-charitable activities. Public charities can own S-corporation stock, but they will pay income tax on their share of the S-corporation stock. And if they own too much of it in proportion to what they are, they could lose their tax exempt status according to the IRS, even though there's no statute that says so. So typically a donation to a charity will be C corporation stock. And those of us who are tax professionals know that a C corporation pays its own tax and distributes its dividends to charity. And that a charity receiving dividends from a C corp does not pay income tax on those dividends, even if the C corp is a four profit corporation. Yes, charities, as we said, can receive IRA qualified charitable distributions. 
And none of these entities are able to directly benefit a foreign charity unless it is registered with the IRS, although a charity may assist needy individuals overseas or needy causes overseas if there is direct supervision by the entity or someone hired by the entity. So that is the public charity. The community foundation has all of the abilities of the public charity and can be seen as a warm and fuzzy intermediary. If you wanna get involved with your community, I had a client who just moved to a city in the United States and his mother donates maybe $30,000, $40,000 a year to charitable causes. He's looking to meet people in his new community. He's learning, he's looking to learn how to be charitable and whether his life journey should be involved with charity like Luz's life journey or, or his profession. So I called the uh, I called the foundation, the community foundation in his city. You know, I'm not going to tell you which city it was, but whether it had been Detroit or whether it had been Dallas or whether it had been LA, I knew I could just call the community foundation and that I could have an engaging conversation with somebody who couldn't wait to take him to lunch. And it came true. He went to lunch. He wrote a $10,000 check to the foundation. That's an account now in the name of the foundation. They'll direct it how he, cho how he chooses. And now he's meeting different charities. He's deciding what his passions are. And probably a lot of money will be directed that way. Lose any comments on your past experience with, with community foundations and whether somebody would consider one as opposed to having their own foundation? So uh, I know from the college perspective, we definitely work with community foundations quite often and some donors, that's how some of our funds are particularly established, right? The donor wants to go through a donor advice fund or a community foundation um, fund. So we work closely with, with, the, with the community foundations. On my volunteer side, I typically, I volunteer for one of our community foundations in the area. And, you know, it's, it's kind of, uh, it's not challenging. It's I always resort back to when people ask, like, what would you prefer? Would you give the money straight to SPC or a community foundation? It really is what the donor's intent wants and what makes them happy, because ultimately we have donors who do both, right, who provide funding straight to the college and then also have something at the community foundation to which we work with to, you know, enhance whatever program, right? So they may not be interested in a particular thing but want to help we utilize that that connection so i don't know that there is a, a a positive or a negative i think from the fundraisers side right is it seems a lot cleaner if we were just straight with the with with the donor and, and getting that way but ultimately whatever the donor wants to to do fulfill their dreams and for us to fulfill our mission we will do and it's never really too challenging to work with either the community foundation or the professional advisor because they're the experts in their own areas. You know, we just are there to facilitate that, that effort. Do you think it's a social recognition thing or a knowledge thing or a marketing thing that these dollars go through the foundation and then you get a small amount versus the people come directly to you? You know, I think I, we have these conversations often in particular because um, one of the conversations we're having in, in this particular task force or committee I'm in for this community foundation is the, the lack of knowledge that happens in certain communities, for example, the black and brown communities about what, com what community foundations do, right? And those communities have great assets, but they're not utilizing the community foundation. Um, I don't know that it's more about recognition. I think it's about the knowledge, right? And, and the expertise on how you can utilize the community foundation to your benefit. Um, and there's particular things that a community foundation can offer per se, then the college may not be able to offer to that donor. So it just makes, may make it simpler and sometimes is a trust thing. You know, they just want to deal with one particular person for all of their gifts and that's okay. Um, so I, I don't know because I've seen individuals again in multiple organizations that I've worked with that have, have both worked directly with the college and also um, work with a community foundation, and the recognition is pretty much similar, if not more, at the university or higher education level, because we want to continue to attract folks to a particular program or thing, whereas the community foundation, 
you're attracting them to give their money and they would manage that for you in whichever area you you want it to be managed. So I don't know. I think that was a very long-winded answer. And I'm pretty sure I bored everybody who's listening. But I did change pitch. So hopefully that's <laughs> All right, so then the donor advised fund has all of the same attributes as the community foundation, except that you're dealing with your financial advisor. You're not dealing with the warm mm -hmm. and fuzzy local people. You're dealing with your broker and you're able to go ahead and move your appreciated stock quite easily to the donor advised fund. And now that's not to say the donor advised fund don't have great people working with them, but typically we see a more passive relationship. The only difference between the donor advised fund and the public charity from a tax standpoint that I'm aware of, is that the uh, charitable, oops, the, uh, the pension, the IRA transfer cannot work to a donor advised fund. It only works to a community foundation. And I think that kind of indicates that Congress knows that when you put money in a donor advised fund, it may not help anyone uh, very quickly versus mm -hmm. when you put money in a public charity, it's probably gonna help people. Now. Now we go down to the private operating foundation. And the private operating foundation is an operational entity. It does something, it operates. It doesn't just accept appreciated assets and dole them out at least 5% of its value per year, like a private uh, foundation. A private operating foundation, the most common example we find is that it has an active scholarship arrangement. And we set one of these up almost every year where a client says, well, you know, I want to give college scholarships to the high school students where the, I went to high school, or I want to give uh, scholarships to people who went to my college who want to go to graduate school where I went to graduate school. And I would like to donate a million dollars today and get that tax deduction. And then I would like to meet some of these students and I would like to have them show me gratitude and, and let me mentor them and really help people out. And, but mostly I want the tax deduction and I want my beautiful niece Guinevere to run it because she needs a job and I'm in a higher back tax bracket than she is and will that work and absolutely it will work and the colleges are very very good at helping to assist but allowing the private operating foundation to do enough lifting so that it is a uh, legitimate operating foundation. And I know one example of that is the Barrett Foundation, who, who does support St. Pete College. And uh, Dr. Barrett has a, a real uh, important view, which is that if he can find a veteran who served in the U.S. Armed Forces, who doesn't have a college degree and he or vocational training, and he can give that person a college degree or vocational training, he is influencing a young life, a patriotic life, and all the people involved with that life. And his feeling is that the success rate of somebody who was honorably discharged from the US Armed Forces is gonna be much higher than the success rate of a typical high school graduate. So that's his bend. And he and his son are very passionate about meeting the people, making sure they select them right, giving them recognition. So that would be an example of a private operating foundation. So let's look at the rules. The same full tax deduction as a, as a public charity. Uh, you can't do private deals between the donors and the foundation, but you can pay reasonable compensation, pretty much the same as the uh, public charity. Now, can you put part of your business into a private operating foundation and get a tax deduction? And the answer is, Absolutely yes, but the, the, the loophole though that you have to work with is that no one in the donor's family can own the voting stock or technically control the, in, the business entity by ownership of the voting stock. So where do you put the voting stock? Well, you can put the voting stock in one of two places. Number one, you can put it in a 501c4 social welfare organization that helps people in your community, but is not a 501c3 because it helps individual people in your community. A 501c4 is allowed to own voting stock and you're allowed to operate and control your 501c4. 
And that's how that's one way to do it. Another way to do it is to put it into a trust that is specifically exempted from the excess business holding rules because it provides 65% or more of its benefits to non 501c3 charities such as cemetery associations and police benevolent associations. And 35% of that trust can benefit your family members or any number of people that you name. And there's a special Internal Revenue Code section, which is very un commonly unknown, but specifically allows for that. So the private operating foundation can own part of the family business, as can the private foundation. And we'll be talking a lot more about that with Michael Lehman in a couple of months. So I hope you'll, you'll join us for that. And Michael will tell you how they do it in New York because they always do it better in New York than in Florida, I've noticed. Now we go to the private, now, now oh, let me mention the private operating foundation needs to spend 4.25% of its fair market value on ex legitimate expenses, including its operation every year at least three out of four years and if it will simply set aside money for that operation the money set aside in a given year will count as being spent for example if you want to build a 10 million dollar school you just set aside a couple million dollars and that will take care of your minimum distribution requirements until that school is completely constructed now, below the private operating foundation, we have the private foundation, and the private foundation has the same rules as the private operating foundation, except for a couple of little changes. One, you don't get as high a percentage of your adjusted gross income in deductions from for the private foundation. Secondly, the private foundation has to distribute 5% a year of its value of its assets in order to not be subject to uh, penalties. Another difference, the public charities are not subject to income tax except on unrelated business income. Mm. The private operating foundation and the private foundation are subject to an income tax, but it's only based on 1.39% of their income. And that may be, include municipal bond income. It used to be 2% if you were a good foundation and 1% if you did some nice things even better. But now they what they did was they averaged what the different foundations were paying. They averaged it came out to 1.39%. So now it's all based on 1.39%. Now, the cost of establishing a private operating foundation Typically, in all candor, this should not cost more than two to three thousand dollars. It is not a complicated document. The IRS gives us forms. The lawyers who have been doing this know what the form needs to say. It should not be an expensive proposition to form a private operating foundation. Most of the ones that we form are formed as charitable trusts so that we do not have to even file anything with the state of Florida or any other state. We don't have to pay any annual report fees. We just have the client set, sign a trust agreement. The more expensive part of this is the form 1023. You have to file an application for tax exempt status. That's usually not too expensive or difficult either. Believe it or not, most of them pretty much look like the others. And <laughs> The, uh, the IRS people who work in the tax exempt area really know what they're doing and want to help. And I think that's why they're working in that tax exempt area. In 37 years I've been practicing, I've never had anything but a friendly, helpful response. And we are getting exemption letters back in three or four months on simple ones and seven to nine months on very, very complicated ones but the interaction is always positive. So I would say, if you wanna to try to do this yourself for fun, see how you do, they will call you and correct you and help you. That process is pretty much the same for the uh, private foundation. 
there's just a few more questions that you have to answer on the form 1023 and on the form 990 for the private operating foundation than on the private foundation. Lose any questions so far? Nope. Okay. So uh, that gives you a lot of information. And uh, let me see what I want to mention next. All right. We've talked about giving to the foundation during your lifetime. And mm -hmm. I want to mention, and we've said this before, we have a lot of clients that don't give anything until death, and then they give a lot on death. And that's a big mistake because not only are you deferring helping charities, but you're not getting an income tax deduction. If I leave something to a charity on death, I don't get an income tax deduction until they die. If I give something to my to my foundation now, I get the joy of giving and the joy of getting an income tax deduction. But especially if you have a client who's giving to charity on death, to the extent possible, have it come from their IRA or their retirement plan. We call that income with respect, I mean, income with respect to a decedent. Because if I die and I leave my IRA to my, my wife or children, they're going to eventually pay income tax on it unless they leave it to charity. But if I die, I can leave my retirement plan payable to my trust. And if my trust is properly drafted, it can allocate the retirement plan to charity first and then to my non-charitable beneficiary second to get that uh, tax deduction. So that, that's the way that you want to uh, consider doing that. Okay, let me make sure that I covered these and that you can see them. On page 31, private non-operating foundations. The family controls it. No one tells the family what to do with it. It stays pretty private because people typically just don't know what you're doing with your private foundation. You do have to file a Form 990, but I'll give you a little trick here. The Form 990 becomes public record in about two years after you file it, but they only put the Form 990 itself on the public record, not any of the attachments. So when we look at Form 990s, we see a lot of them, and the whole form says, name of foundation, ABC Foundation, tax ID number, this. Income, see Exhibit A. Expenses, see Exhibit C, B. People who received compensation, see Exhibit D. Charities you benefited, see Exhibit E. So it does stay private to some extent. The non-operating foundation gives at least 5% of its assets to charity each year or for charitable purposes. And uh, as I said, there's lower adjusted gross income requirements. Page 32 just tells you about the 1.39% excise tax on, uh, on private foundations. Now, here's some big no-nos for private foundations. Number one, the only financial transactions that are permitted between the foundation and what we call a disqualified person, which would be a donor or a party related to the donor, is it is okay to loan money interest-free. It is okay to rent space to the foundation rent free. And it is okay to share expenses with the foundation if they're sharing your office space. And it's okay for them to pay anyone they want reasonable compensation for services rendered. But other than that, no deals with the private foundation. You could donate stock in your company and have them as a partner in your company, but otherwise not sell them stock in your company. Number two, if you've made personal pledges, those personal pledges cannot be satisfied from the foundation. You have to satisfy your own personal pledges. Next, don't use the foundation to purchase tickets for fundraisers or even split the cost. Now, you know, you get something from the charity. Thank you for coming to our fundraiser. Or thank you for agreeing to come to our fundraiser. 
your $1,000 admission price is $182 for food and entertainment, and the rest is uh, uh, $816, $818 charitable organ uh, donation. Well, you can't write an $818 check out of your foundation or out of your donor advised fund. That money, the whole thousand has to come from you. The IRS does not like the splitting in that way. Number four, they don't like it when you pay travel expenses for family or bring family members to dinners or other events unless it's really, really all charitable. So your foundation is not a place to play games. We're aware of a high profile family in New York City right now who played some games with their private foundation. And uh, it'll be interesting to see what the outcome of that is. Um, Luz, any questions or comments or suggestions? No, I think um, I'm glad you brought it up. No, I've definitely been a part of conversations where um, prior to maybe a lot of knowledge or people who are in the right space that have this type of knowledge, you know, some some donors just sometimes make decisions without really consulting those professionals and organizations can tend to be, particularly those who have been standing for so long, um, in, like such, such as higher education, that you end up having some sort of conversations like the one you said, right? Where, well, yeah, I'll go ahead and sponsor this. And it's coming from a, a private foundation and someone from our group, right? Not in this particular case, SPC, but someone from our group will end up being like, eh, and I don't know that we can really do this. So let's talk this through, right? So I'm glad that you're covering that because from our end, again, we're experts at a lot of, diff we're, we are knowledgeable in a lot of different things, but we're not gonna be experts at everything. So that's why we wanna work closely with individuals who have this understanding. We have the basics, right? But to the detail and the knowledge, we never want to advise our, our donors wrong or provide the wrong information. But it's interesting you mentioned that because I've definitely been a part of those conversations where I've I've, I've been a little confused <laughs> at how it how how it could um, not been caught prior. Okay, very good. Okay, I've got a, a question here from Macy. In my opinion, what's the minimum amount of funds needed to establish a private foundation of either type? Well, a lot of colleagues disagree with me, but I think $5,000. I think if you if you spend $5,000 and set up the private foundation, announce to your friends that you have a private foundation and have a party and see if you can raise some money for charity and see if you enjoy the experience of having the foundation. There's another kind of foundation that I wanted to mention. And that is what we call an incomplete gift foundation. So I could form the Allen and Marcia Gassman Charitable Foundation as a Florida trust. And my trust agreement can say that the purpose of the foundation is to benefit 501c3 charities and individuals who, for example, went to my high school who may have need, regardless of whether the distributions to those individuals will qualify under code section 501c3. So guess what? That's not a charity. It's an aspirational trust. So there's no IRS rules that apply to that trust. And if I retain the right to replace trust assets with assets of equal value, that trust does not have to file a federal income tax return, and the donation I make to the trust is not considered to be a donation. Hmm. So let's say I want to get my kids involved in a foundation, and they say, yeah, we want to do a foundation. Okay, great. Well, let's do it on a trial basis. Let's set it up as an incomplete gift foundation. We'll put the money in, and then we'll see what our kids do with it. And if our kids give the money to charity, then we'll get the tax deduction when they give it to charity. If our kids don't do a darn thing, then we'll find something to do uh, with the monies. Now, I had a client recently who was getting married and he had about a $5 million estate and he wanted to make sure that he could give a million dollars to his alma mater 
on death or during his lifetime, as long as he didn't need the money. And he wasn't sure if he was going to need the money yet. Mm. So we set up an irrevocable trust before he got married. And the irrevocable trust says this is the alma mater, the John Jones alma mater trust. And unless I need this money for dire circumstances, when I die, this money goes to the trust. And dire circumstances will be defined by my friends, Harry, Mary, and Jerry, who went to the school with me. Mm. Well, it's kind of like a built-in prenuptial agreement. The psychology of this is, he said to his new wife, the psychology of it was, he said to the new wife, I've committed this million for the charity. It's in the trust. I probably can't get it back. Do you have a problem with that? Do you have an expectation with respect to that? Mm. And he said, no. She said, no, I don't have a problem with that. But he just feels more comfortable that she's not going to try to change his mind about that. And, and that would be a, a private, uh, incomplete charity. How, Alan, I'd be interested to know. I have honestly have never heard, well, never heard of that name. I'm sure we've worked with something like this at previous institutions, but how did how did the institution record that? I don't know. I don't know. They probably recorded it as a death promise as, gift. As a death promise, okay. That'd be, that's just so interesting. Look, look at that. And well, I don't know if the institution even knew about it. You know, he didn't have to tell them. Yeah. So, but if there are anyone listening out there, which there should be 89 people listening, please tell your people to let the institutions know. It makes it really difficult and challenging once people are gone to try to figure these things out. And are you, I'm sure you're evaluated on how many pledges you get every year. Or, and so when they send you a copy of the, of page six of their will, which shows that your school is in there if they all die in a common accident you and actually get yeah and it's a really simple it's a real honestly quite simple process as long as we have something documented it just makes it easier too i think alan i'll share briefly he helped me sort of draft an email to someone because it had been several years and they wanted the college to be they were named the college in their in their in their estate no planning one. Um, but we didn't have any record of it, right? And the person had since passed, so we're trying to be sensitive in speaking with the wife. And we understand that, you know, that's that it's to be expected, but it's a little bit easier, especially in transition. Um, it's a little bit easier to ensure that we have everything recorded so that we make that that space and that conversation as as um, sensitive as possible on our end. Because again, we deal with this in a completely different way than than professional advisors do. So please tell people to just send an email to whoever their alma mater is or organizations or groups, whoever it is, so that it's re recorded somewhere. Right, right. Absolutely. So so Brandon, are you listening? Uh, my partner, Brandon Ketrin, was going to come on. Brandon! Oh, wow. There you are. Very good. So, so Brandon, can you explain how the rules work when a private operating foundation is going to set up a scholarship fund or another arrangement that will benefit individuals, given that the general rule is that charities are set up to benefit broad areas of support and not just three or four people you might have met. Unmute, if you unmute. want to unmute. It'll probably sound better. Are you, you can hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. All right. So the main thing really to take away is if you want to be a private operating foundation, you have to do just a little bit more than just selecting applicants and giving away scholarships. Um, there's a couple of different ways you can do that. I think the, the standard language is you have to have significant involvement in the activity. Um, so you want to either you know maintain contact with the recipients of the scholarships, assist them with job searches, introduce mm -hmm. them to community leaders, help mm -hmm. them out, you know, networking, um, just be as involved with them as you can as they go throughout the process. 
you know, you want to, um, there was one tax court decision that talked about the, the foundation was actually set up to promote a um, local county as a desirable place to live. And they gave scholarships to individuals from that county and tried to encourage them to, to go get educated and then come back to work in the county. And that was okay. That was deemed to be a, a private operating foundation because they had that active involvement with the individual and tried to encourage them to come back by inviting them back annually for um, fundraising events, for introducing them to, you know, to the local um, business people in the community. So all that works well as far as the scholarship goes. And, and that's more than just you know, selecting applicants, screening applicants, and, and providing them with scholarships. You have to be a little bit more involved with that, but there's ways to do it. The other thing to keep in mind is, is you really want this to be a defined class of individuals and something that's limited in scope. So it can't just include your next door neighbor. You know, you want to have it to be for based upon need, um, based upon particular areas of interest. Maybe you want to promote people that are going into um, medical school or law school or, or some other type of uh, um, industry. The other thing to keep in mind is this cannot be given to any disqualified person. So anyone that is related to you by blood, um, by um, financial relationship, those are all going to be big no-nos as far as granting rewards and scholarships to those types of individuals. There also should be no non-discrimination policy, nothing based upon race or sex or gender or any other type of, of, of defined class and protected class. You want to make sure you avoid those issues as well. Um, and just to speak briefly on the, the disqualified person too, it, you, it's pretty clear it doesn't include family. You can't give a scholarship to my son. That's not going to work. But the other part of this is if Alan has a foundation, he probably couldn't give a scholarship to my son either because Alan and I are related financially. He, you know, he's the partner of the firm. He, he provides me with my salary and benefits, and we just have too close of a relationship to, uh, to really for him to be benefiting someone that's related to me as well. So you got to watch out for those issues. Um, but I think that just gives a good background there, Alan, and or are there any any questions on on those? How long does it take us as lawyers to fill out the paperwork to facilitate a client's private operating foundation having a scholarship arrangement? Yeah, it's it's not um, you know too too difficult. I would say for the most part, the 1023 application that you have to file to establish the the foundation. It's now all online, um, so that makes it a little bit easier than the the old paper forms that we had to fill out. But that's probably half a day, and then you know you want to have a scholarship plan. You're going to want to have directions to the board. You know, come up with a selection committee and criteria for um, what you're going to give the scholarship for, and all that's really dependent on how detailed the client wants to be. It could be you know something that's drawn out over a process of a couple of days or a couple of weeks, just tweaking the plan. Um, but it's not not terribly difficult to to put in place. Okay, Brandon, I had uh, two two questions I couldn't answer, so I'm going to see if they can stump the panel. Okay, if I have a charity donor fund, so I guess they have a donor advised fund, and want to start a private foundation, can I transfer the money in my donor advised fund to the private okay. foundation? And this is from from Janet. It's a good question. I, I I don't know that you can. I'm, I'm leaning towards no, but I, I I'm not 100% sure on that. Here, here's my here's what I think the answer is, and then we're going to research it and send Janet an email. Well, first of all, I don't think your donor advice fund is going to let you send money to any entity that is not a public charity. Yeah, that's the that first. Be my point. You're first going to have to send that money to a to a public charity, but you may be able. Oh, there you there's Luz. She's willing to accept you. <laughs> But the question is, once Luz gets it, is she willing to write a check from her mm -hmm. charity to your private operating foundation so that mm -hmm. you can then award scholarships? And I would think that that would be permitted. I, I don't know that it's not, but I'm rusty on that, so we're going to find out. Here's the, here's the second one, Brandon. Can a charitable trust purchase assets from a corporation owned by the trust? The trust is a private foundation. I don't know. I would have to research that one too. I mean, if the if the so the actual foundation owns the the actual corporation, I I wouldn't think that would be an issue because it's it's a transaction with the charity itself, not necessarily a disqualified person. Yeah. Um, 
you know, you could just as easily distribute the asset to the charity as you could purchase it from from the charity. Right. That's the thing. If the charity owns a C corporation, the C corporation can distribute whatever it wants basically to the charity. And typically, well, that may cause a dividend issue or, or a uh, C corp tax mm -hmm. loss situation. Mm -hmm. But it's a good question. If a private foundation gives scholarships, does the recipient have to include it in income? I don't believe so. I think there's an exemption for that. Um, I, I, the one in particular, though, if it covers more than tuition, so, you know, I guess if it covers rent or room and board, that may not qualify there. I'm not 100% familiar with those rules. So, Luz, what are those rules? Do you know? Two so tax it depends. It's, <laughs> it's, it depends. So students, when they fill out any sort of FAFSA, which is what happens at any institution, you fill out a FAFSA to determine you know what your need is and then you may apply for private scholarships outside of the foundation or within the foundation and some scholarships may cover more than tuition right as as brandon shared it may take into consideration financially may take into consideration rent and 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 bills so forth so on um but it really does depend it depends on one what the scholarship is covered for and two how it will be taken. Sometimes when the student has to, if the student exceeds the amount of dollars that they really need and they did receive that extra expense of money as their um, net check of extra funding they had, they may have to do that. They may have to um, um, claim that in their, in their taxes. Um, I know many years ago when I was a student um, and I did receive additional funding through scholarships and I reported it, um, they did ask me if it was to cover additional books or additional rent and then you know that was that's how they made the, the tax people were like okay well this really is an extra income for you because it is covering stuff for for um for schooling so it does really depend um it really does depend for um in case but i actually brandon i wanted to highlight something you mentioned about um people who are disqualified in receiving um the funding because oftentimes individuals whether they are going through Private, a private foundation who sets up a scholarship and have their own committees, but are still part of SPC. So for example, students can search scholarships under the foundation and outside of the foundation. Um, donors tend to, you know, they talk to each other. So some people are like, well, my friend has a private scholarship that's for SPC students and they get to pick their students. Well, the gift is under the foundation it's a gift <laughs> so we cannot have you be the person who selects who gets a scholarship and how those you can set a certain amount of criteria but you cannot be essentially the final say on how that scholarship is selected or who gets that um that scholarship if the money is through the foundation right so private scholarships is different but i want to make sure that you brought that up and i feel sometimes people think i'm making it up because i i want to have full control i'm like no i promise you i don't want to get in trouble and i don't want you to get in trouble it is a gift therefore that is part of the component of it um but certainly we have worked with with private foundations who you know selected to say we still want to give the money through sbc but we want to have this control um and we can certainly assist as well on that but i'm glad you brought that up because i'm not the only one who says it <laughs> okay so if i if i give the money to the university or mm -hmm. i fund the endowment then i can't choose the student who gets the scholarship so if you have a gift agreement with the spc foundation right um and we accept that gift agreement for an endowment you're able to set sell, set up scholarship criteria right that tells me what kind of student you eventually want it to be but you cannot give me five hundred dollars or five hundred thousand dollars for me to go look and say this money is only going to maria because then right. that is not that isn't it's not a gift right however we do have scholarships from private foundations that are not that the students have access to and help support SPC and they are the ones that manage the entire process. We're just a facilitator to it. So we help market that scholarship, for example. But we simply on our side, if the money is in the foundation, we cannot have Alan Gassman be the person who selects the Alan Gassman right. scholarship. But if I set up the Alan Gassman Foundation and I work a relationship with you, then I can choose SPC students Yes, it, it depends, but yes, yes. Okay, so I had one last question. Can private operating foundations support foreign charitable entities? And 
The answer is only if the foreign charitable entity is approved by the IRS as a legitimate charity. Otherwise, you have to go ahead and do your own activities offshore. We typically recommend that the client hire what they call a chartered accounting firm in the jurisdiction where they want to, to give the assistance. And then the, the chartered accounting firm writes a report saying, yes, all of these water filters did go to needy people in Bangalore or all of these blankets did go to needy people in the, in the Himalayas, and we went and gave them out ourselves. So you could do it with foreign accountability, but the IRS and, the, and all of the government is of course simil, uh, sensitive to what's going on offshore because they don't want anyone to get a tax deduction for mm -hmm. supporting terrorists, basically. And uh, that's why you register and get specific permission for that. Well, uh, Brandon, thanks so much for your help. Luz, thanks as always for your comments and presence. Uh, join us Wednesday, June 16th with Professor Jerry Hash on life insurance, both charitable and non-charitable, and Wednesday, July 21st on charitable planning for the business owner with Michael Lehman. I hope everybody has the rest of the afternoon and evening as a great experience. And please do one little thing for one little charity just today, one little thing for one little charity or one big thing for SPC, whatever you like. Lose any final words? My only final words, one, thank you again, Brandon. Thank you again as well. I always walk away with so much more knowledge than, and I know I provide very, very limited information here. But again, if you all have any questions, if you wanna learn more about SPC, or if you have particular questions about programs, or you have a donor who really is interested in higher education, um, please contact me. If we are not a fit, which I don't know why we wouldn't be because we're amazing, but if we are not a fit, um, we are certainly, we work collaboratively across the Bay and across the state with other institutions as well. So please, 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 if you have questions, let us know. Um, and we'll be more than happy to answer. So thank you so much, Alan and Brandon. Thanks to you. Have a great one.